Canada's Woke Nightmare, A Warning to the West, is a hard-hitting documentary about Canada and the state of affairs in our culture today. And with me here today is the journalist and producer of this incredible documentary, Stephen Edgington. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much, David. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. Canada was a very stable, middle-class country with reliable institutions. To say that's gone is to say almost nothing. Canada. Under Justin Trudeau, the former British colony has sought to position itself as the global bastion of progressive politics. We have become a totalitarian state. As his cultural revolution shows no sign of abating, I went to Canada to find out how ordinary Canadians are dealing with Trudeau's radical reforms. The sexualization has become militarized. From the promotion of gender ideology. What the f is that? Do you want to talk about it? To the legalization of drugs. Overdoses are up. Violent crime is up. It's, it's, it's a jungle. Radical new suicide laws. Do you think that they want you dead? Yes. I, I think it's wrong. And clampdowns on freedom of speech. I think our leader, Trudeau, I don't think I've ever heard him say a true word. All this nonsense about compassion is the manipulations of snakes pulling in the useful idiots who perhaps are genuinely compassionate, and that's Canada. Well, Stephen, first of all, congratulations uh, for this uh, great documentary. Uh, I know that you're the Daily Comment editor and a journalist with the Daily Telegraph, certainly one of the UK's leading uh, newspapers. Why did you decide to undertake this documentary? I think British viewers are obviously fascinated in our former colonies, in the Commonwealth, in countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and particularly in the political developments in those countries. There's a huge interest, for example, in the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand and what she did during the coronavirus lockdown. There's sort of similar interests in Australia, but particularly Canada has been somewhere where I think our readers in the Daily Telegraph have been very interested in, in terms of its political developments. And whether that's through the trucker protests a few years ago, that was very widely covered here in the UK, and more recent developments that we cover in the film. I think that, as I say, as the title of the film says, Canada, a warning to the West, that's why people are so interested in your country. It's because I think when you see the excessive way that the Canadian government has taken so-called woke ideology or excessive liberalism and implemented it, I think the outcomes are absolutely fascinating and represent for us a warning. I have to say, I don't say that um, you know, with any glee, uh, you know, you're, you're obviously in Canada and have to deal with these situations. We also have our own problems in the UK, of course, and we can talk about that, I'm sure, later on. But I think that, you know, there's always this there's always been a historic link between Canada and Britain. And we're very concerned for what's going on in your country at the moment. Well, it was it's, to me, it was very fascinating to to meet you. And, and I uh, had the pleasure of, of having a discussion with you. Um, what I found fascinating was that you covered an awful lot of ground in the documentary. And uh, how did you, like, it, it's amazing. You talk about our permissive um, framework regarding uh, medically assisted suicide to gender ideology in the schools. You talk about basically the rewriting of history. Um, I mean, it is really a lot of ground that you covered. How did you end up figuring out what to cover in this documentary about Canada. We are so lucky in Britain to have a very diverse and big media space. And that media space has covered so many issues in Canada in recent years. So 
these have been top these have been topics that I've been reading about for many, many years in all sorts of publications in Britain. We have a very healthy conservative media space in the UK with some excellent publications of which I've worked for a few of them. Uh, the Spectator has been doing excellent work covering issues in Canada, in particular on the issues you mentioned of assisted suicide. Um, what, the topic that we discussed, the so-called indigenous genocide narrative, these have been widely covered in Britain. And it's been something that I've been closely following in my own interests. And I think that in the UK in particular, when you look at an issue like MAID, the MAID laws, we're having similar discussions in our own parliament at the moment. Legislation is going through the House of Lords as to whether we should legalise assisted suicide. And I think that the spotlight really has gone on Canada when, as I said, when you look to these issues that we are considering now and thinking, OK, so what's the outcome been in Canada? OK, so how is that going to impact the UK if we implement those same policies? So looking at your knowledge of the UK and Canada now, would you say Canada is truly a warning to the West? Like it's an interesting, dare I say, provocative title. So are you saying Canada is like really far out uh, as an outlier? in front of when, when compared to so many other countries? I think it is. I think that everything that we covered in that documentary is more extreme in Canada than in most Western countries. The only exception I'd say, perhaps, is our investigation into drugs and homelessness. And obviously, these are huge issues in Vancouver, uh, in places like Toronto. I know that there's some excellent work done by a documentary maker we we interviewed in the film, Aaron Gunn, and he's made some brilliant documentaries, Canada is Dying, where you can highlight some of these issues. And they are definitely very, very bad in Canada. But at the same time, there are some cities in America which perhaps are comparable. You could look at San Francisco, for example, where we also made a film. And the situation there is just as bad as Vancouver, if not worse. So I'd say that but when you look at the other issues we covered, you know, gender ideolo ideology in schools, for example, I think um, the authoritarianism of the Canadian government in terms of how it restricted those trucker protests, bank accounts, I think that's completely unprecedented in a Western country. Obviously, in places like China, they have instigated similar policies. But actually in the West, and this is, an, this is the conversation I had with Jordan Peterson, where he made this point. Canada really is an outlier when it comes to these issues. And if you look at the way the Canadian Parliament has acted in terms of enabling the legislation to, um, I suppose, to restrict freedom of speech, to, uh, you know, when you look at gender transitioning, that's another example where they've got this bill where you're not allowed to um, so-called, so you're not allowed to sort of what they call conversion therapy. You can't stop um, children from becoming transgender, for example. So I think... What ha what's happened in Canada, it seems to me, as is that this legislation, this kind of woke legislation has become embedded in law. Whereas if you look to somewhere like the UK, we're having huge cultural issues here at the moment. Um, in America, you've got different states with different laws on these subjects. But in the UK, we've had a conservative government for the last 13 years. There are huge issues here. We have we face exact same issues as you do in Canada in terms of wokeism, et cetera. But the legal framework is less, I think, than in Canada. I think that we have some laws which I think are causing huge issues. The Equality Act is one of them. In US states, obviously, um, there are some states that are worse than others, and you have federal legislation as well on top of that. But in Canada, the Canadian Parliament seems to have gone further than most Western countries when it comes to these woke ideas and kind of woke ideology. So what would be your theory, Stephen, as to why Canada has gone down this woke path. Um, and I, I, I mean, I, I think it's interesting how we describe what wokeism is. I mean, in my definition, I re refer to it as, as almost like a hyper-political correctness, which is really totalitarian. It's actually very anti-democratic or, or Marxian. Um, so why, why has Canada gone down this path further than others? What's your theory on that? Well, as you say, wokeism, it's this idea that I mean, I think we have to mention as well identity politics. And, you know, it's this idea that certain groups are better than others. Ha certain groups have original sin and certain groups are forever going to be oppressed. So 
basically you have kind of white men. We're the baddies. We're the ones with original mm-hmm. sin. We're the ones to um, colonize the world and cause and oppress every other minority group. And then you have everyone else who are in this kind of hierarchy of oppression who must be protected and offered certain advantages. And that's kind of how I see wokeism as an ideology. And in, in Canada, this is something we discussed in the film. Canadian Canada's identity as a country, I think, has historically been a bit weaker than, let's say, Western European nations. So you could look to England and English history, and we have a thousand years of consistent history as a nation. And over those, over that millennium, you can see uh, traditions form. You can see uh, our legal system is created. The English common law is created over hundreds of years of precedence being set. You can see a real tradition that can be traced back as I say, a thousand years. And when you're able to have a system like that, that can iron out all of the problems over over lots of people making different errors and different mistakes, you get to a point where you have a very, very stable and strong identity as a nation. And um, you can rely on those institutions. Whereas in places like Canada, those nations have existed for a lot, uh, you know, fewer years than um, than their Western European counterparts, and it takes it's, it's a lot harder to build that sort of national identity, particularly when the the idea of the British Empire, the idea of Canada's past, where it came from, has become so unpopular in Canada. So the idea of colonialism, of the white man coming over and taking other people's land and oppressing the native populations, this has become a real kind of a a narrative of guilt. And I think many in Canada have tried to disassociate themselves from their own nation. They're embarrassed about their past. So they have to create a new narrative. They have to create a new identity. And what is this new identity formed on? This new identity is formed on wokeism as an ideology. Canada is going to be, we are going to be the most liberal, the most tolerant, the most progressive nation on earth. And in particular, when we have America as our southern neighbor, we are going to be better than them. We are going to be better than those conservative yobbos, as a a sort of English slang there, um, those conservative, uh, you know, sort of uneducated, ignorant MAGA Republicans, no, Canada's going to do it better. We're going to be the liberal country. We're going to be the tolerant country. (laughs) And what does that mean? That means passing legislation, which, as we've talked about, is extremely authoritarian. And uh, in the name of diversity, in the name of tolerance, in fact, Canada has become incredibly intolerant towards those who it views as enemies on that hierarchy of oppression, to those who do not accept this, these new woke mantras, this new gender ideology, etc. So I think that when Canada swept away its identity as a nation, swept away its links with the British Empire, when you look at attacks on John A. Macdonald, those stat- we went and interviewed Maxime Bernier outside of a statue of John A. Macdonald, which was boarded up. In Toronto, because um, the the uh, sort of local uh, parliament or local government are deciding whether to remove the statue or not because of attacks from different activists, and we, you know, we talked about in our interview the fact that um, Canada changed its flag, the fact that on the Canadian passport they're removing the famous victory at Vimy Ridge in the First World War and re- removing it with little images of squirrels and things like that. You know, so again, it, I think it's this sweeping away of Canada's historic links to. Britain of Canada's traditional identity and replacing it with something very novel and something very new, and that is the the concepts of multiculturalism, tolerance, progressivism, and ultimately wokeism. I I think that's a brilliant uh, summation, and I almost don't know whether to cry or smile when I hear that type of summation, Stephen, because when I saw the documentary, and I've I've shared it with many, many uh, colleagues and friends, um, People are kind of embarrassed by it. Um, at least this is the common reaction I, I receive. For this reason, is that Canada has inherited an incredible tradition from the Anglo-Saxon tradition of rights and freedoms and respects for, for people's rights. Um, and we don't seem to get it. It's like we've, we've forgotten it or we're, we don't even understand our own history. It's really kind of bizarre, isn't it? So it's interesting to hear your perspective as someone from the UK, a, a person from another nation, come in and say, wow, this is, this is what's happening to your country. So wake up. Uh, I, to me, that documentary was very powerful in that way. 
I am so concerned for what's going on in Canada. And I think people around the world and in Britain are so worried for ordinary Canadians. And particularly, and can I say this about the, the Canadian media, which is something that I'm, I find absolutely extraordinary. When I was in Canada, I was told by so many people that, that Canada's media are not covering the topics that we covered. No, and I have no. to say, I was absolutely shocked and astounded at how well this documentary did. I never expected four and a half million people on YouTube to watch this film. Wow. I mean, I literally completely blew my mind. I mean, it's the most watched thing I've ever done in my career. You were surprised, Stephen, uh, that it went so viral? Absolutely. I couldn't believe it. And I have to say, I, I, have, I, I suspect the reason it did so well, or one of the reasons it did so well, particularly among Canadians, because most people who have viewed that film are Canadians, right? If you look at the statistics, I suspect it's because Canada's media are not focusing on the issues that we covered in that film because they feel that those issues are too controversial to touch. Now, I know there are some exceptions to that, and we spoke with some of those fantastic independent journalists at True North, even mm -hmm. at Rebel Media, and in other publications and more independent voices that we spoke to, Billboard Chris is another one. But beyond that, the, the kind of mainstream media in Canada seems to be ignoring, to a large extent, many of the topics that we covered. I'll give you an example. We went and interviewed a woman in Montreal. Just She lives just outside of Montreal, Christine Gautier. Mm -hmm. She was one of the most amazing people I've ever met. I mean, just an extraordinary figure, real hero. She was a veteran. She was a Paralympian. And for many, many years, she suffered with terrible disabilities, physical disabilities. And she's had to um, try and deal with that through the Canadian government asking for assistance. And, you know, for example, she told me that it took 12 years to get a new wheelchair. I mean, that in itself is just terrible. She also wanted a, a ramp in her home, a disabled ramp to help her get down the stairs because it, at the moment, and we, we literally saw her do this, it causes her a huge amount of physical pain and distress just to go downstairs and to uh, go outside in, in her home. So she wanted a disabled ramp like anyone else would want. You know, she was saying, I want dignity and respect in my life. And the response from Veterans Affairs Canada, the agency that was dealing with her, the chap on the phone said to her, well, um, you know, the ramp is a bit expensive and it's difficult to get it for you. She's been asking for the ramp for many, many years. Uh, Maid, have you considered assisted suicide? And wow. I mean, to say that to someone, again, I... In, this the can I, I suspect this can only happen in Canada. This can and um, we can talk about the maid laws in more detail. So, she Christine Gautier, just to finish that story about the Canadian media, she said to me that she'd been interviewed by the Italian media, by the French media, literally people coming all the way from Paris to her home. We obviously came all the way from London. What have the Canadian media done to report on her story? Well, originally, they came to her house and they wanted to talk to her about Veterans Day. And suddenly, I think this is two Canadian media outlets, and suddenly they, they discovered this story. And, and to be fair, some of them did cover the story. But she was saying, basically, this her amazing and extraordinary tale has been covered far more by the international press. And I include this is including interviews actually with Fox News that never got released in the end. So the Americans, the French, the Italians and, and the British all covered her story, but the Canadian media to a far lesser extent did so. And I think that that says everything you need to know about what's going on in the sort of Canadian media landscape. Utterly bizarre. That That is truly outrageous. The, the story about Christine Gauthier, the, the veteran, the athlete, and, and who's really struggling and then who's suggested, uh, you know, have you, have you considered made as an option? Um, is, is just really, it, it was very emotional to see that story. And I think that's part of the power of that documentary is you tell a lot of heartfelt stories about Canadians, about their struggling and they're, they're essentially victims of this asinine, woke, hate-filled kind of ideology and approach to living. It's, it's really quite an eye-opener. So um, there's a very powerful clip there. Uh, that we can show about uh, her story. So you've done a lot for your country. How do you feel Canada has treated you in return? <sighs> Completely abandonment. 
can you tell us what happened when you asked for this? Was it the, yes. the, the ramp outside you needed? Yes. I said, you know, I, I just can't keep going like this. I can't keep living like this. Like, with this has to be done. This has to be resolved. And the person stated, you know, Madame Gauthier, if you really feel you can't go on like this, if you really feel you can't do it anymore, you know you have the right to die. So it's like, wow, I can't believe, you know, after all of this time, not only will you not give me the equipment I need to live, but you will help me die. I don't think it's a government's place or an hospital's place to decide, yeah, okay, you're a little depressed this week. Here, sign this, people, this paper three times. I will ask you, you sure you want to die? I, I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong, and I think it's just going to keep uh, drawing this country into a deeper, deeper, deeper hole. Another story that you got into, Stephen, that I thought was also very revealing was by this wonderful family, I think it was the mother and the son, who were of uh, obviously proud Canadians but of Indian background, and they reflect on their historical experience of Canada um, and how it evolved and, and, and multiculturalism, and, and it was just really kind of a, a delightful interview. It was also got these crass elements to it, but it was, it was very, very interesting. So did that surprise you, how that, that fellow described gender ideology as being militant within schools? I mean, I, I thought it was really quite, quite a shocker. This is so, such an interesting topic, isn't it? And, and sort of how multiculturalism has been a bedrock of sort of Canadian identity for decades now. Mm -hmm. And you could go back to the 70s and look at what Pierre Trudeau was doing with his sort of multiculturalism act, etc. And you've seen mass immigration into Canada for many, many years. And the same in Britain after the Second World War, we, see, we saw huge influxes of immigrants from all around the Commonwealth, all around our former empire, coming to live in the UK for the first time. And we became a diverse nation for the first time. And how did different countries like Canada and the UK deal with that? And I think when you look back to some of those immigrant communities, many of them integrated very well into Britain and into, Ca and mm -hmm. into Canadian society. And this was a fantastic example of a family who come from India and who had respected Canadian traditions, who wanted to become Canadians, who, res who sort of respected the rule of law, who wanted to learn English and, um, and be part of that really strong Canadian identity and, be and to be Canadians themselves. And I think they really admired, from what the discussions I had with that family, they said they really admired Canada as a country, as a peaceful, safe, wealthy, excellent place to live. What other, what else could you want in, in the world to live mm -hmm. in a place where you could walk around freely, you can earn a lot of money, the infrastructure is fantastic, the people are polite. This is really an unprecedented situation in human society where you can have such a brilliant place as Canada, just a massively beautiful, stunning, excellent place to live. And I think that's why it was, it was so attractive to immigrants, um, you know, sort of when we're talking about after the Second World War. And it's no surprise that these immigrants do not agree, or many of them do not agree, with Justin Trudeau's yeah. and the Liberals' vision of Canada today. They come from a religious background, whether that's uh, Christian or Hindu or Sikh, which was the example that we were into. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were from a Sikh background. And they are traditional. They are, in their own way, conservative. They believe that there are men and there are women. Right. They believe um, they do not believe in gender ideology. They do not think that children should be sexualized. Mm -hmm. They do not think for and to give you the example that we use in the film that um, Ni Ranjan, the chap we were interviewing, his son was asked to dress up in the opposite gender's clothing for some sort of cross dressing day in his school, and he refused to allow his son to do that. And he found that incredibly insulting and, and frankly, disgusting. Mm -hmm. So it's no surprise that many ethnic minority communities within Canada are um, sort of quite angry with Justin Trudeau's pushing of these new, novel, very kind of woke ideologies because they come from that traditional conservative, almost religious background. And so, you, so you've seen a bit of a backlash there. But there's another um, angle to this as well I want to mention as well. You know, So we've got these fantastically integrated communities within, the, within Canada and within places like Britain. But unfortunately, in recent years and in recent decades, we've also seen uh, a huge rise 
in immigration from places where people are not integrating into Canada, are not integrating into the UK. And unfortunately, as I say, immigration has ramped up to, to, to levels that has become unsustainable. And I think when you start, when you're starting to have communities that refuse to integrate, that refuse to learn the language, that refuse to respect the, to respect the culture, that um, are not uh, necessarily working or, uh, you know, that m- they may be claiming benefits and things like this, then you have a serious issue and you have, pl- you know, you have um, separated societies in London in particular, you can see uh, sort of the, almost the ghettoization of um, of different communities. And this leads to suspicion. This leads to an increase in crime. This leads to just a general feeling of tension and a, a decrease in the quality of life. And I think that according to the this family that came from India in the 1970s, the people that I was speaking to, the mother, she was saying she was so distressed about how Canada has become since this huge influx in immigration in the last few decades that she actually now wants to leave Canada. She doesn't feel safe anymore. She thinks it's too expensive. She's absolutely she wants to leave that's that's and i believe that's into her intention she's so the quality of life for her she feels now has become so bad and she lives in toronto um that she wants to leave so you know and and she she herself was blaming that on this huge rise in in immigration that has caused so many issues in canada where you don't have proper integration into, into canadian society you don't have people respecting canadian traditions And you're having a two tiered system, you're having segregated society. So I think that can only lead to ultimately division and a lower quality of life for everyone. It's it's really bizarre. It's a very powerful story uh, that you tell in the documentary. Another story that you uh, aren't afraid to discuss, and that is about the whole restorytelling, if I can tell, if I can say that, of residential schools. Um, You have that story where uh, a number of uh, children uh, went there, uh, and, and we know that's a long history and it's complicated, but the bottom line is it was not perfect. There was abuse that happened, but there was also a lot of very positive things that happened in those schools. Um, and that's not me making it up. That's from reading the original Truth and Reconciliation report of some 3,500 pages. Uh, a lot of people have never even read the report, so they don't even know what's in it. Um, so what I what I find fascinating is that you you had the the insight to pick up on that as a very significant story, the one that can be used to kind of uh, dare I say rewrite Canada as a kind of an evil nation um, and and to rewrite history. Is that why you picked up on the significance of that story, Stephen? Yeah, I think that there are two reasons we think we thought that this issue was so important and so interesting to investigate. As you say, first of all, this has been a subject and a narrative that has been pushed in Canada by many conservative politicians, by many liberal politicians. And I suspect the motivation behind that is because there is a narrative of guilt. And Mm. in Canada, they have to have this story that we were these evil oppressors against the minority group and we must atone for our terrible sins because in America you have the terrible experience of slavery and the Jim Crow laws. Uh, But in Canada, you didn't really have a black population, so you can't really repeat that BLM narrative. Obviously, in Britain, we feel very guilty and ashamed, uh, or many activists say that we should, of the British Empire and how we colonised various different parts of the world, how we supposedly oppressed many, many people. And in Canada, I think, you know, the Liberals, they want to have their own narrative and they decided, look, this is the perfect opportunity to mm-hmm. um, to express our, our guilt for, for basically being white, for being rich, for being a wealthy Western country. And there's got to be some terrible reason behind this. And perhaps it's because we oppress the Indigenous people. Now, I think the second reason we thought this was so, also so interesting was how how truth itself in Canada has become attacked and you know when we look into the evidence of these supposed mass graves in Kamloops and I'm sure everyone who's watched this show knows all the background about this but for those who don't they they had this sort of ground penetrating radar in 2021 they said there were 215 disturbances under the ground in near a residential school in Kamloops and they claimed that this was evidence of a mass grave site 
However, no bodies have ever been found. The site has never been excavated and there has been no evidence that this was in any way part of some sort of genocide against residential children in this residential school in Kamloops. So the idea that suddenly that that there is a genocide against the indigenous people became um, the official narrative. I mean, the Canadian the Canadian Parliament passed the resolution to describe it as such. Justin Trudeau urged the Pope to uh, have this kind of decree to say that there was a genocide, which he acquiesced to, unfortunately. And even, as I say, the Canadian opposition, the Conservatives, agreed that this was a genocide and apologised um, for this terrible uh, supposed uh, happening. However, the only problem is there's no evidence for it. So suddenly you've got all of these politicians creating this narrative, which is utterly false. And now, as we explored in the film, Canada's justice minister is considering passing laws which would actually uh, ban people from denying this narrative. They, they're comparing it to Holocaust denial. And we spoke to someone in the film, a teacher, who said, uh, who told his students in 2021, actually, this wasn't a mass murder of children in Kamloops. This was probably they probably died of tuberculosis. I mean, he he wasn't aware that the site was fake itself, but he was just making this speculation. And within 30 minutes of him saying that, he was frog marched out of the school and he was told he was never going to teach again. And I think this is an interesting uh, just something that I learned today about this about the film, I actually received a complaint or the Telegraph re received a complaint from a Canadian teacher to the official regulator of the British press because she claimed or they claimed that we had lied about the uh, residential schools and that we'd made that we were pushing a false narrative about this. And she said that sh that she had taught our uh, film in her uh, classroom to, to her students as basically an example of propaganda and how the media lies and manipulates and spins things. She said this without any evidence. I mean, we she sent us wow. uh, links to various uh, news articles, but I'm sorry, we were, com we were completely accurate in the film and the complaint will be, I'm sure it'll be dismissed and we've got no, we're not concerned mm -hmm. about it in any way. Um, we're, we're totally sure that we've got it right. But I su suspect that this is probably the attitude of many Canadians, unfortunately, that once you start, uh, disagreeing with this narrative, they then want you to be shut down, and they go to the regulator and they go, they do everything they can in your in their power to censor those who uh, disagree with them. And I think that that's a great example, exactly what's going on in Canada, wow. of someone trying to do that to us, basically. I find that example just stunning. Where and I I experience this as well, where I talk to Canadians and I say, well, you know, there's been no evidence found to date. And they're, they're usually shocked and surprised. Others are kind of suspicious and say, well, um, yeah, that kind of makes sense. I've kind of wondered whether there's really been any, any evidence. But we run on facts and evidence in civilization. The rule of law, we don't just run on speculation or hearsay. And um, it seems like Canadians are just missing, or some Canadians are missing the entire plot. But it makes sense if you live in a country that has a high trust society where people generally trust that what you're saying is true. And when your political leaders on both sides and the Pope say something, you would expect that it's true. Right. So I can understand why people wouldn't question what they're saying, what their leaders are telling them. I mean, you grew up, you, you grow up in this in this um this miracle of a society of a Western country where everything works very well and people trust each other. Right. But unfortunately in Canada and to a certain extent in Britain and other countries, um politicians are undermining this high trust society, this um the, as you say, the rule of law um, the belief in truth, the belief in fact, and are undermining that by pushing false narratives. And I think it's a complete disaster for our structures as societies, for Western civilization, when you have political leaders pushing lies and trying to punish people who disagree with them, um, you know, using evidence and facts and logic um, with, with the law. And that is authoritarianism. And that's what happens in authoritarian countries. That is what happens in um, in, in communist societies, in communist dictatorships. So I'm, I think it's very, very concerning. And that's why we wanted to look into this Kamloops uh, issue. 
Well, before we get into some, some larger questions about what's really going on here, I did want to ask you, Stephen, on the claim regarding mass graves, and there's no been, no, as you said, no evidence found to date. Um, how is that played in the UK or in larger Europe? Um, is that known as a story? And, and how do people view that? I think to an extent it's known in the UK. And as I said, there has been reporting on this ever since the Kamloops uh, band made their claims in 2021. And particularly through uh, various conservative publications, less so in the more liberal media, um, there has been, I think, a bemusement of what's um, going on in Canada. A sort of a sort of how can how can this possibly be happening? And I think people find it utterly surreal it's completely bizarre and they read this story and they think gosh that's that's just absolutely it's just weird it's yeah. just weird that you have all these politicians making these statements without any evidence and i think you know to to be so blatant in it mm-hmm. in it and to to refuse to dig up these grave sites to prove of what they're saying to prove what they're saying um the fact that they're refusing to do that i think people in britain look at that and they just think this is very very strange yeah it, well, certainly for me as a Canadian, it's it's frankly embarrassing. We need to run on facts and evidence, as, as you've said so well, uh, Stephen. So I did want to talk about some elephants in the room about the documentary. One would be, and I'm, I think you're the person to help us, you know, explore this question. And that is about culture. What is it about? Is there something about Canadian culture that is so susceptible to these um woke ideas. I mean, the wokists are masters at using words and things like diversity, equity, inclusion. And by the way, I've, I've had the uh, not so pleasure of studying the Frankfurt School for years. So I know where these words come from. And uh, they come right from people like Herbert Marcuse and these nuts. Um, and yet they're being used and they're almost kind of attractive. What the heck is going on that our culture seems to be so susceptible to this, Stephen? Help us. Right. I really, really feel awkward talking about this. And I'll tell you why, because it's not for me as a Brit to judge other people's cultures. I feel very embarrassed <laughs> um, to to make some comments, right. which some people in Canada might find uncomfortable. So please forgive me. Yes. Um, and I'm going to uh, sort of uh, sort of say this first. First of all, I had a fantastic experience in Canada. I think it's an amazing country. I met some really, really inspirational people. I was t- genuinely and this is a, 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 you know, I'm not just saying this because of the film or whatever. I, I really felt this. Not only is Canada, Canada a warning to the West, it's also uh, an example of inspiration and ho- of hope. And there are so many Canadians who are fighting back against what's of what's going on. And we met some so so many interesting and inspirational people, including Christine, including many others who we interviewed in the film, who I just thought, wow, you are amazing and you're so courageous. And I think there's so much we can learn from you. And there's so many Canadians who are like that. So that's my kind of qualifying statement. Okay. So is Canada a polite country? Is Canada a nice country as the stereotype goes? In my experience, and in this experience of me and my camera, and as we went to Canada, we unfortunately met some Canadians who were not very polite and who were not very nice. Um, we went to Vancouver and we were screamed at, we were shouted at by various drug addicts and people who work for NGOs who were very, very unhappy with our film. Um, when we were out filming with Billboard Chris, who's the activist who ha- who goes out and uh, speaks to people about radical gender ideology, we had some very, very unhappy people uh, shouting and screaming and being extremely rude and aggressive. Um, in some other uh experiences that we had in hotels and things unfortunately there were some incidents of people being very very rude but but that's not everyone and i think that generally canadians like to um, see themselves as a polite people and they like to see themselves as a very welcoming people and a very tolerant people and the problem is and this is the thing that we discussed in the documentary of jordan peterson when we talked about the psychology of wokeism the psychology of canada i asked them to put some put Canada on the psychologist's table and to psychiatrist's table and to figure out what is going on in Canada that makes them so susceptible to workism. And he basically said, when you have excessive niceness, that to, a, to, a, to an extent, that is also a weakness. And that enables predatory psychopaths, this is what Jordan Peterson said, 
essentially left-wing authoritarians to take advantage of people's tolerance and people's niceness and people's politeness and to push their boundaries to such an extent that they can win and that they can uh, they can shut down um, any opposition. So ca- Canadians might feel that they're being we're being very polite and we don't want to disagree or argue with um, all of these people who just want diversity and inclusion and equality and they say that they want all these fantastic things that in the name of compassion and we mustn't say anything because it'd be extremely rude and and it'd be very naughty and um, um, and we mustn't push back in any way. But actually, this has led unfortunately to people like Justin Trudeau to push a very, very radical agenda onto Canadians and to stop people from speaking their mind. And I think that's another theme that we had in the documentary where we spoke to Canadians and many people said to us, we totally agree with you. You know, we're not woke. We don't like what's going on. Find it totally unacceptable. But I can't say it on camera. I can't, I just can't say it publicly because I'm so concerned about the backlash that I might have in my personal life, from my friends, my family, but also from my employer. And that's the scary thing, from my employer and from the government. And that's the difference, I think, between Canada and Britain. You know, I might get social, socially isolated or social feel social sort of ostracism because I'm conservative and I say conservative things and I say people, things people don't like and people think are offensive and terrible, etc. I might lose friends, family, whatever. You know, that's quite natural. Anyone who has fairly controversial conservative opinions in any country, unfortunately, has to sit experience to a certain extent their views being mis- misrepresented as bigoted or evil or whatever. That's the kind of motivation. However, when that when that um, I suppose idea permeates throughout government and throughout in, and throughout in private institutions in terms of your employment rights, that's the difference. And I think in Canada, that's the worrying thing where you can say something and you could be fired for having holding very, very normal political beliefs. And that's, you know, I'll give you an example. Another example we, we interviewed in, in the documentary, Amy Hamm, a nurse in British Columbia for 10 yes, years. She was a nurse, indeed. had no complaints. Yeah. But suddenly she supported JK Rowling and two members of the public complained to the regulating regulating body of the nurse of nursing in British Columbia. And she faces losing her nursing license. So she faces losing her entire career all because she supported a gender critical um, celebrity, J.K. Rowling, and has written gender critical blogs. In other words, she believes in two bi- biological sexes, which is what most people believed up until five minutes ago, all throughout history. So that's the difference in Canada. If you say what you believe, you could genuinely there could be real serious consequences for your job, and you could even um, be punished under the law. Wow! No, what a what a wake up call. I, I think what you've given is really a, a great summation, a reality therapy, if you will, of how serious this is in Canada and how another person from another country views us. Um, it, it really is concerning the status of so many professional associations. And, and ironically, uh, you spoke to Jordan Peterson. And since that time, he's uh, got into um, complaints, obviously, with his own on I believe it's the Ontario Psychological Association of all things. So it's it's really gone nuts. Um, so the other side to the elephant in the room, I would say, is who's really working to advance this type of woke culture? Um, we, we have the usual suspects, but I mean, the role of, of political leadership in this is really quite significant, isn't it? I think Justin Trudeau, he is someone that you know, I find it totally fascinating. And he is obviously someone who has uh, led to this huge social revolution in Canada. And he has he has been at the forefront of pushing uh, very, very extreme laws, whether you look at the made legislation, whether you look at the um, legislation covering freedom of speech. And I know that the reason Jordan Peterson became a celebrity academic around the world was because of, I think there's Bill C-16, mm-hmm. where he was talking about imposed speech laws, where you must use people's gender identity pronouns, etc. Um, and this is completely unprecedented. And as you say, recently, Jordan Peterson also is going in, into this kind of legal troubles where they're trying to impose on him um, to do some sort of mandatory training again so i think it, justin trudeau is a huge part of this i would also say and this is something that we mentioned in the film unfortunately i think the canadian conservative party have been fairly weak on many of these issues 
Um, they've supported Trudeau in, in lots of this legislation, particularly when you look at um, the gender, gender transitioning and the um, sort of conversion therapy issue. That's another one where the Conservatives were supporting um, Justin Trudeau. Pierre Polyev, although he's far more, uh, I, I suppose, uh, sound and kind of conservative on lots of issues, he still tends to ignore um, issues of gender ideology and transgenderism and children, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there's been, it's not just Justin Trudeau, you've got, the, you know, there's blame on the other party as well. There's been a lack of opposition. The Canadian media, again, has there been enough scrutiny of the government? I don't know. It seems that many of these Canadian media companies receive government funding, which seems, again, a w very weird and thing for me as a British person from British media company to see Canada, uh, Canada's media being funded in, in a very, very significant way uh, by the government. And that yeah. seems just completely uh, wrong from a moral perspective, from a journalistic perspective. How can you have integrity as a journalist if you're taking money from the government? And also, um, it's also wrong from a sort of market perspective as well, because you're crowding out other competitors who don't have access to that government funding, who perhaps are dissenters or who perhaps, perhaps refuse to accept the government line on certain things or whatever. So I think that there are so many issues in Canada. And again, when you when you look at the kind of uh, woke cultural revolution, it's not just in government, it's not just through parliament, but it's also a decentralised movement that works throughout many institutions and is run by a minority of very, very um, active campaigners and kind of diversity zealots who are also pushing this ideology through their own institutions. And um, they're doing this, as Jordan Peterson said in the film, through this kind of, um, they're taking advantage of people's politeness, people's niceness, people's willing to be tolerant. And um, they're using that to push through their very radical agenda. So I think it's partly the politicians, Justin Trudeau has to take a lot of responsibility for this. Conservative Party hasn't done enough uh, to push back. The media hasn't scrutinized the government. And um, unfortunately, this is a decentralized movement. Many, many uh, activists throughout many institutions um, are pushing this individually as well. No, it, it, is, it is really something um, who's pushing this. And would you say that's actually quite a small number of people um, or organizations when, when you look at this? I think so. I think, you know, if you look at opinion polls, I think majority of Canadians would probably disagree with much of what the government is doing. Um, I think particularly when it comes to issues like free speech or pushing gender ideology on children, this is very divisive. Most Canadians, most people uh, instinctively would disagree with much of this stuff. And as you say, I think it is a minority of people who are pushing um, their very, very, their very sort of radical views and they're doing it because they can hold people over a kind of moral uh, barrel of a gun, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like we hold the moral high ground. And if you disagree with me, you're a bigot or you're a racist or yeah. you're a transphobe or you're a homophobe. And I think that is a very, very powerful weapon. People being absolutely terrified of being described in some way as bigoted or racist or whatever. And particularly that's an issue in Canada where people love to view themselves as being polite and nice and tolerant, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that's what's going on. It's this minority of people who are pushing this stuff. So you've you've got a lot of perspective on these issues, Stephen, not only in Canada now, but also in the UK and elsewhere. What would you say are some of the lessons that you've learned coming out of this documentary uh, is, is one, one lesson I think that you, you referenced is that you get what you tolerate, ironically. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. And I think um, this idea of uh, tolerance, I think Canadians should learn a bit of intolerance for once. I think, I think you've got to stand up for yourselves. I think, um, you know, I interviewed some amazing people who are doing that and who are fighting the good fight and who are trying to raise awareness and who are trying to organize. And I think um, when you see in the UK, we've had some very successful movements pushing back against, let's say, gender ideology. We have some uh, feminists in Britain who are, who are doing wonderful um, things here in, in shutting down. There was, there was something called the Tavistock Clinic, which was a clinic which was transitioning children. Yes, that then got indeed. shut down after pressure from activists. We've seen some excellent wins in the UK, even in the US. In some states, you've got people like Ron DeSantis passing legislation. I think there are some really, really 
really, um, you know, and, and when you look at school boards in America, you've got these conservative activists, these just ordinary um, parents deciding I'm going to stand for election in my local school board and I'm going to stop gender ideology being pushed on my children. I'm going to stop the sexualization of children. So I think there are some amazing things that ordinary people can do, um, you know, going all the way from just you know, as I say, parents or whoever, to the politicians at the top. I think people need to grow a backbone. I think that it is possible. Don't give up. It's very possible to fight back against these things. I know that um, there's an election, you know, in, there will be an election in Canada where you will have a choice on the ballot for Justin Trudeau. And I do hope that Canadians um, decide, you know, and I think when looking at opinion polls, it looks that Justin Trudeau is, you know, every day becoming more and more unpopular. But I think that there is a fantastic opportunity um, for much of what's happened in Canada in recent years to be reversed if people decided to be a bit more intolerant of the woke ideology, a bit more intolerant of Justin Trudeau and had a bit more courage. And I think that, as I said, we have highlighted some of those Canadians who do have those amazing qualities. And I think that we can all learn from from these amazing individuals. Stephen, I really like your challenge to all citizens to not be afraid and to speak up. Uh, this is a very important time for our country in Canada. And I want to thank you on behalf of all Canadians, quite frankly, for taking the time as a journalist from the Daily Telegraph from London to be able to come to Canada and uh, help tell our story so that we can be better informed and aware of it. Thank you so much for your uh, great insight and leadership. Thank you, David. I really enjoyed being in Canada. I loved interviewing you. I think it's an amazing country. Don't get me wrong. I feel very, I, I don't like criticizing other people's countries. Um, I think there's lots of wrong things going on, on in Canada. But as I said, I think there are some so many inspirational tales as well. And I think I, I cannot say, you know, I, I cannot say how much I was impressed by so many Canadians. So thank you, David. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.